Welcome everybody. My name is Rachel Garnham and I'd like to welcome everyone to this event discussing the bloody history of UK and US imperialism in Palestine and the Middle East. Today's forum is hosted by the events platform Arise, a festival of left ideas with the socialist media partner Labour Outlook. So this is a particularly important discussion in light of the latest Israeli government aggressions and atrocities that we see in Palestine on a daily basis of over recent weeks and now months. Um, these have been condemned widely across the globe, but sadly not by the leaders of the political establishment here in Britain. And I'm sure we were all horrified by the game playing we witnessed in Parliament yesterday. This session is all the more relevant because of the UK bombings in Yemen and US bombings in other countries in the Middle East as well. So we're looking at the wider picture here. For many of us who've been active in solidarity with Palestine over the years, it's further confirmation of our need to stand firmly in solidarity with the Palestinian people and call out the backing of our UK government, the US and others for Israel's illegal occupation and abuses of human rights, including through arms sales. It's also confirmation that we were right to oppose the wars on Iraq, Afghanistan and Yemen and must again push for peace which must also mean opposing the new nuclear arms race. So we've got a lot to cover this evening. Um, to discuss this, we are joined by Bernard Regan, a Palestine Solidarity Campaign Executive Committee member and author of the Balfour Declaration, Empire, the Mandate and Resistance in Palestine. Um, then we'll have Sami Ramdani Iraq, from Iraqi Democrats Against Occupation, who's a sociology lecturer and decades long campaigner against war and sanctions in the Middle East. And finally, Kate Hudson, who is the General Secretary of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, an officer of the Stop the War Coalition and author of Breaking the South Slav Dream, The Rise and Fall of Yugoslavia. Um, we want to have as many questions and comments from the audience as possible, and it's good to see so many of you joining us. Um, because of the size of the audience today, we have volunteers who are going to be facilitating the questions through the, the Q&A function in Zoom. So please post both your comments for discussion and your questions to the speakers using that function. And we'll have a time, time for a few, quite a few questions, hopefully, um, after the speakers. So please start thinking of them now. Um, and if you can, please donate on the link provided um, because um, these events don't, don't happen for free. So um, without further ado, I'm going to move on to our first speaker, who is Bernard Regan. Thank you for the introduction, Rachel, and, and hello to everybody. Um, I'm going to try and just put the whole situation in some sort of context from the point of view of historically how uh, Britain came to be in the region in the first place and uh, hopefully then identify some of the challenges that were faced by the Palestinians <clears throat> when they were under occupation from the British from 1917 through to 1948 and then conclude by drawing some comparisons also by uh, with rather the um, events that are currently taking place and how they are, um, in a sense, in continuity with the oppression uh, that the Palestinians have en endured under the British. <clears throat> I want to just say from the outset that I think it's important to dispel this notion that events in, and the British engagement in the Middle East suddenly began either after uh, 1945 or began even um, at the end of the First World War in 1918. Um, because if you look at the history of Britain, uh, in actual fact, they were in one way or another engaged with the whole Eastern Mediterranean from the 16th century onwards. There was a body called the Levant Company, which was responsible for kind of creating monopoly trade uh, arrangements with uh, Britain and with the Eastern Mediterranean and Mediterranean areas in much the same way that the East India Company functioned and other similar kind of chartered capitalist com uh, companies functioned. So the British were trying to uh, Germanize that area and in so doing were in competition in particular with the French. Um, and that became very uh, evident in the 19th century with the uh, attempts by uh, Napoleon, for example, to expand French influence in the Eastern Mediterranean but also with the uh, 
development of the Suez Canal and the way in which Britain was anxious to retain its influence in that area. So it uh, carried out what was really a de facto occupation of Egypt uh, in the 19th century, in the late latter half of the 19th century. And during that time, suppressed attempts by the Egyptians to achieve their independence in the most bloody way, and, and also carried out a vicious war against the people of Sudan. And that was part of kind of Britain seeking to ensure that it was in a, a strong position. So, you know, it, it's not new. It's, there is a continuum there that runs through. And of course, after uh, the First World War, uh, Britain occupied Palestine from 1970 and onwards. And the nature of that occupation, I think you could crudely put it, was very much that it was the case of suppressing the rights of the Palestinians seeking self-determination in order to meet the commitment that the British had given to the Zionist Federation and to uh, Zionism as an organisation, a political organisation. And that commitment was one which we all know was embodied in the Balfour Declaration, a, a commitment to say that they would provide a homeland for the Jews and in so doing, completely deny and negate the rights of the Palestinians uh, in terms of of their rights and their attempts to seek independence. And I think it is very important just to say that the Palestinians were seeking to do that from certainly from the beginning of the 20th century, if not the end of the, of the 19th century. Uh, they had, incredibly, they had more democracy under the Ottomans than they ever received under the British in that they had elected representatives in the Ottoman parliament. And they were seeking to establish their right to self-determination, something that was consistently denied right the way through from the beginning of the British occupation. And I suppose it's a hallmark of the intentions of the British that after 1917, when uh, they were, Palestine was under military occupation, that one of the things they did was to recruit uh, additional military forces to create what was called the uh, British Palestine Gendarmerie, which was composed in very, very large measure of members of the Black and Tans. This was a military force that had been operational in, in Ireland, in suppressing uh, the Irish struggle for independence, in the, uh, certainly in the War of Independence in 1920, 1921. And they did so in the most bloody uh, way possible. Uh, they uh, carried out, for example, raids on villages where Republicans were sus suspected to, to be uh, present. Uh, they burned down houses. Uh, they rounded up people from villages, uh, they tortured people, they conducted rape. Uh, and this was the character of the force which the British brought in. And I think it was very deliberately an intimidatory force threatening, or as it would have done, and it did do, uh, threatening the Palestinians in any uh, moves that they might make to seek uh, independence and to challenge the British rule. Uh, that was uh, went on. Uh, not only the Black and Tans, which actually were dis the gendarmerie that was established, discontinued from 1926, but many of them remained in the what was called the Palestine Police Force under the famous story of an inspector who was in charge of the Jerusalem Police Force, a man called Duff, uh, who was notorious for the kind of uh, punishment and torture that he carried out. Uh, and it's from there it's thought that the expression duffing people up came, uh, that it was his kind of methods that uh, subsequently um, the, the Zionist uh, police force said they'd learnt a lot from him because he was able to conduct to torture without leaving any kind of evidence. Uh, but certainly uh, the most repressive uh, experience and period uh, of British rule in Palestine was undoubtedly that between 1936 and 39, when the Palestinians rose up uh, to try to assert their independence. There were many examples in the intervening years that I haven't got time to go into, but certainly the period 36, 39, in my view, was the critical and defining period in terms of subsequent developments. Uh, during that period of time, uh, there was, in uh, late 1936, a general strike. And the interesting thing about this general strike is it gave ro rise to the establishments of bodies called national committees in many of the towns across Palestine. And they had their own courts, they had their own postal system, they established 
in my view, what some people might call uh, a, a system of dual power, challenging um, the British in all of its aspects of how it was functioning. And so uh, significant was it that subsequently, after another failed attempt to get some kind of resolution to the situation that was you know, through processes of, um, you know, the British um, with fake notions of legislative councils and bodies of that kind, which were totally undemocratic, didn't relate to the demography of Palestine and gave Britain uh, and the, uh, the Zionist forces a right of veto over any decisions that were made. The uh, most, uh, if you like, uh, hard fought portion of that period from 1936 to 1939 was from 30, 1938 onwards when there were the, the uprising took the form of an armed struggle with uh, uh, the Palestinians winning large areas of the rural uh, countryside, but even taking over the old city of Jerusalem for a period of time and engaging in actions across the whole of that area. And it's an indicative, if you like, I think, of the scale and dimensions and, and success of that struggle that the British military presence increased to something like 50,000. It was a huge number of British soldiers that were actually deployed in Palestine to suppress uh, the rising that uh, took place. And, you know, it's thought even by some people that Chamberlain, when he negotiated the um, sort of pact with Hitler in uh, 38, uh, that he did it in part in order to ensure that there was enough British forces to suppress the Palestinian uh, rising uh, that was taking place. And the way in which that uh, uh, uprising was dealt with was in the most vicious way with, um, again, as I've said, in relation to the Black and Tans, with the conduct of torture, of fining villages or burning houses if they were adjacent to um, for example, where actions had taken place uh, by the uh, Palestinian rising, uh, there were people who were tortured viciously. Um, and there are accounts, for example, of places like Albasa, where uh, people were um, taken out, uh, where people, men and women, were separated, and two cages were established, one for the so-called good Palestinians, one for the bad Palestinians, uh, that is the good ones, those who would might hand over uh, arms or might name people that they implicated as being responsible for action. And they put water in one of these cages out in the hot sun and in the other nothing and left people to die. And, and older men who were present in that uh, died of, of, of heat and exhaustion and so on. Um, in, on top of that, uh, they, uh, they put something like 50 men from the village in a bus, and that bus was then driven over mines and, and blew up, and they were completely blown to, to pieces. And the villagers were then required to dig trenches and, and to bury them. And there are other examples like that. And the point being that the way in which the British acted was extremely vindictive, and you can see those kind of actions, uh, in a sense, replicated in what... Israel is doing today, in my view, what it is doing today in Gaza, similar kinds of actions. And it's the case that um, the, uh, the, the, in 1948, uh, in the Nakba, uh, this happened again. Uh, Ilan Pape and Nur Masalha and other uh, historians have documented uh, more than 20 cases where massacres took place of so, uh, whole villages uh, being slaughtered, of people uh, bearing white flags being shot down, um, uh, rape, torture, and all kinds of things happening. And uh, much of it is reminiscent of some of the visions and some of the images that we see currently in Gaza in terms of the brutality of the way in which the Israeli defense forces, Israeli occupation forces, are treating Palestinians in that region. So the history of Britain's uh, bloody oppression uh, in the Middle East is a consequence of uh, a long protracted engagement that they've had, all of which, of course, has been in order to further British interests. And they were quite explicit from the outset and they remain in many ways. You can still see them in a sense reflected in a, in a way by the action of the Houthis, 
the Suez Canal remains even today a critical tri trade route. You can see that oil, 50% of the world's reserves in oil, exists in Iraq and Iran and Saudi Arabia. So you can see that these are massive consequences which were critical, in my view, in shaping British policies uh, towards the area in the late 19th century and in the 20th century, and they continue through to this day. Thank you very much. Uh, absolutely spot on and so important to remember there was a history in Palestine before, um, well, before October and before 1948 even, and it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting to hear, hear all that. I'll, um, before I move on to our next speaker, I'm going to invite um, Sam Browse, who is a volunteer for Arise Festival, to address us um, and tell us a bit more about today's organisers and what you can do to support. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, I think kind of the fiasco last night um, shows how important meetings like this are um, at a time when there's so much obfuscation about Palestine and dissembling about the ethnic cleansing that's taking place there. Um, meetings like this are, are really critical and it's really vital that we come together, not only to um, uh, to, to be in each other's company because sometimes it can feel stifling being out there in the world <laughs> listening to all this rubbish but also um, to educate ourselves um, you know by listening to the eloquent speakers we have tonight so all I would say is to underline the importance of these meetings and they they they, they take an infrastructure um, they take volunteer time um, they take um, they take work to put on and and resources um, in the last year, our um, costs for running these events have um, increased by about 50% um, along, with, uh, along with inflation. Um, so I recognise there's a real cost of living crisis right now, an ongoing cost of living crisis. But if you can use a donation link um, posted in the chat to donate what you can, um, uh, it'd be fantastic if you could uh, the suggested donation of £20. I know that's a lot. Like I say, our, our overheads for running these meetings have increased dramatically in the last year. And um, that'd be fantastic or whatever you can. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say um, was just to highlight an event we have coming up in the future on International Women's Day, which is uh, Women uh, Women for Palestine Rally. Um, details of that will be posted in the chat as well. So you can continue the conversation there and the debate there. That will be on 6.30 at 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, the 5th of March. It will be fantastic to see uh, the names uh, currently in the participant list on, on this uh, on this call uh, there as well. Uh, finally then too, I'll just leave you by reiterating um, that call for donations. Please, if you can donate, it's what allows us to put meetings like this on. Uh, it's more important than ever, like I say, that we cut through all the garbage that you get on the media and come together, have these debates, learn more about the situation in Palestine, because that will help us advocating and fighting for uh, Palestinian liberation uh, in the UK. So thanks very much for um, tuning in today. And thanks very much, Rachel, for calling me. I hope you enjoy the rest of the discussion. Thanks, Sam. And um, I would reiterate, you know, we all have a um, responsibility to educate ourselves as well as be out on the streets and um, Arise is doing a very good job of, of helping us to do that. Um, our next speaker is Sami Ramadani from Iraqi Democrats Against Occupation. Sami, over to you. Great to see you. I was trying to unmute myself there. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and I thank Bernard for going through some of the vital historical information about Palestine. So I needn't uh, go over that much, only in as much as I'll refer to it, if it's relevant to what I'm talking about. Um, uh, what I will do probably um, usefully is to uh, highlight some of the landmark days and dates um, throughout the 20th century and into this century, um, because as the title of our meeting says, it's, it's a really bloody history of uh, US and British uh, imperialism, and I would add French imperialism if we're talking about uh, the 20th century and post uh, World War I and during World War I. World War I was very significant for the Middle East because uh, an agreement, secret agreement, was uh, 
cooked up by Sykes Pico. Sykes is the British diplomat and Pico is the French one when they divided the uh, Middle East into into areas of uh, colonial and imperialist control. Um, uh, France uh, took over Syria and Lebanon uh, while Britain uh, maintained control of Palestine, uh, uh, Iraq, uh, and Jordan. Uh, although Britain also had massive uh, uh, control over Iran, Egypt, Sudan, uh, the entire Gulf region, but the Sykes-Pico agreement was namely to do with the borders uh, delineated uh, regarding Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, Iraq, and uh, and Jordan. Um, and this uh, division of the Middle East between the victors of World War I uh, might sound like old history, but the region actually still suffers from that uh, bloody episode when the Ottoman Empire collapsed and Britain and France took over uh, the region. And they managed to install puppet regimes throughout the uh, the area. And these puppet regimes, some of them are still with us today, generations later, uh, backed by uh, imperialist violence. Um, and with reference to, to violence, I will mention some important episodes where uh, US and British imperialism and French uh, uh, bloodied the region, the region with their military uh, uh, operations and coup d'etats. Um, the first big uh, uprising against uh, their rule came in the 1920 revolution in Iraq. Um, and Britain, although managed to suppress that revolution, they could not rule Iraq directly anymore. So by 1921, Iraq gained so-called independence, but we remained under uh, a British semi-colonial rule uh, until the 1958 uh, independent uh, and democratic revolution of 1958. Um, throughout this uh, period of 1920 to 1958, uh, there were a number of uprisings that were crushed by the puppet regime and backed by uh, by British uh, uh, intelligence and military backing to these corrupt regimes. Um, another quite an important uh, date to refer to is the uh, 1953 coup in uh, in Iran. Uh, Iran, the uh, for about a year had a patriotic government led by Prime Minister Mossadegh. Um, Britain devised a plan to overthrow that government. And the plan was given to the United States and the United States, uh, 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 if you like, executed that British plan, the coup in 1953, which killed uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people and overthrew the government of Mossadegh. If we want to understand Iran even today, we need to go back to 1953 as to why the Iranian people have become so hostile to US and British uh, control over them. Their struggle for independence was quashed in 1953, and they could not regain their independence until 1979 through the Iranian revolution. I don't want to go obviously into what happened in 1979 and the different political forces that launched that revolution. But the upshot of it is that as of 1979, Iran became a truly independent state, regardless of what we think of, uh, of its various governments. Um, another quite uh, significant day is the 1963 fascist coup in Iraq. As I mentioned earlier, 1958 uh, revolution, democratic revolution, rid Iraq of British uh, control. Uh, this government lasted four and a half years until 1963. In fact, February 1963, 8th of February 1963, when a fascist coup was launched. It was CIA engineered, backed by Britain, uh, that overthrew Qasem's government, patriotic government, which instituted quite a number of democratic measures like land reform, uh, trade union rights, uh, uh, rights of political activity, and so on. 
freedom of the press and so on. Uh, so that coup of 1963, they killed thousands of socialists, Democrats, uh, women leaders, uh, student leaders and so on. And Iraq, if you like, still suffers till today from that 19, 1963 coup, uh, which eventually also led to the bringing to power of the Ba'ath Party and eventually Saddam's regime as of 1968, uh, and he became president in 1979. Um, uh, he was backed, uh, the Iraqi, successive Iraqi regime since 1963 coup were backed by the United States and they were, and they instituted br brutal repression in Iraq until Iraq was occupied by U.S. forces in 2003, which led to the killing of a million Iraqis, over a million Iraqis, in fact, um, following 13 years of murderous sanctions in which, according to the United Nations, half a million Iraqi children died. Um, so if you like, I'm, I'm focusing a bit on Iraq because that's where I was born. And that is where uh, much of the bloodshed led by US imperialism happened, uh, with the exception of Palestine, of course. Um, 1956 is a very important day as well because it was the tripartite tri aggression against Egypt. Um, Israel, France, and Britain decided to invade the Sinai and have a war with Egypt because Egypt uh, nationalized the Suez Canal. Um, that uh, tripartite ag aggression against Egypt shook the entire region and showed decisively the entire Arab world and the Middle East how imperialism is, uh, is so wedded to Israel and that Israel had become by then quite an effective tool for imperialism in the region. Um, that war ended in failure because the United States was not directly involved. U.S. influence started increasing in the region after World War II and gradually they started replacing British and French control over the region. But the decisive moment, if you like, in which the United States became the dominant power in the region is 1956, when uh, Eisenhower and the United States forced Britain and France to stop that war and eventually forced Israel to withdraw from the occupied Sinai. Uh, Israel reoccupied the Sinai in 1967 war, and in which they also occupied the rest of Palestine, West Bank and Gaza, and they occupied the Golan Heights, uh, Syrian Golan Heights. So you could see that uh, that uh, uh, U.S. dominance uh, also meant that Israel became a much more dominant military force in the region, backed by U.S. Uh, by U.S. support, uh, financial and uh, uh, military, diplomatic, political, giving Israel full cover to, in, the, in the 1967 war and later wars as well, 1973 war and later wars against the Palestinian people uh, throughout Palestine. Of course, several wars against the people in Gaza. Uh, the invasion of Lebanon, 1982, was completely a U.S. Uh, uh, backed uh, war uh, in which Israeli forces uh, occupied Lebanon, encircled uh, the Lebanese capital Beirut for nearly 90 days um, and then a fight against the Palestinian resistance movement at the time which was centered in, uh, in Lebanon. Um, they forced the Palestinian resistance out, but they committed several massacres throughout Lebanon and the famous Sabran's Shatila massacre uh, in Beirut in which hundreds of Palestinians, some say nearly 2,000 Palestinians were slaughtered when uh, fascist Lebanese fascist forces of the Falange entered the camp with the supervision of Israeli forces which were surrounding the uh, Sabra and Shatila refugee camps uh, in Beirut. These are if you like, some of the highlights of uh, have I got two, two minutes? Two minutes. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, so, if you want to tie up the pieces, what I would like to stress uh, in these two minutes 
is that there is there was a lot of debate throughout the Arab world um, in which there were two opinions. Is Israel a, a tool of U.S. imperialism or is, is Israel and the so-called Zionist lobby, Jewish lobby, is the dominant uh, force for uh, making the U.S. become so pro-Israel? The Arab regimes uh, adopted the second approach, saying that if we befriend the U.S. imperialism in the United States, then maybe we could convince them to support the Palestinians and the Arab cause um, and force them to uh, to uh, abandon Israel. Obviously, that's a fallacious view. History has proven time and time again that uh, that Israel is is. Uh, nothing but a U.S. Uh, advanced base in the region, both in the military sense, it's a massive nuclear power. I'm glad Kate is following me because Israel is a threat, a new, uh, uh, poses a nuclear threat to the entire region. They have over 200 nuclear bombs. They have become part of the U.S. defense, uh, so-called war machine, uh, using Israel to threaten not only the peoples of the region, but in any future global war being such a massive military uh, and nuclear power. Um, so it has to be stressed that the current war of genocide against the Palestinian people in Gaza is not possible without U.S. support, approval, and instigation. Just like the war against the Lebanon in 2006, when Israel tried to crush Hezbollah in Lebanon. It failed because the resistance was too powerful. But Condoleezza Rice was forcing Israel, in fact, at some stage to continue that war in the Lebanon in 2006. But they withdrew in defeat. And similarly, today in Gaza, this genocide against the Palestinian people, this uh, only genocide in history, which is being televised live minute by minute with the world watching, and with U.S. imperialism providing full uh, military, political, uh, diplomatic uh, uh, backing and support. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry to hurry you along when there's such a lot to cover. I just want to make sure we, we get to some questions as well. But so important to understand what's going on in the context of not only the history of the Middle East, but, but what's going on now and in, in the region. Um, so just to say hi to, and thanks to everyone who's joined we've got people from winchester colchester keithley Loxheath, pontypreeth bergen in norway county durham camden chelmsford somerset streatham and the people's republic of islington north apparently um and just um <coughs> and edinburgh and andalusia andalusia um and um just a a request from for the speakers that um, could you perhaps speak a little bit slower if you can, because I know there's a lot to get through, but um, some comrades are struggling to keep up with the captions, I think. Um, or, or So, um, yeah, that's that's just a note on that. And without further ado, we'll move on to our final speaker, who is Kate Hudson. Welcome, Kate. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rachel. And um, inevitably, there's going to be a little bit of overlap with what other people have said. Um, but I'm thinking it's going to be synergistic, really, not boringly repetitive. Um, so I want to focus on the role of the UK in all this, particularly in terms of its relationship with the United States and how that has developed in the post-Second World War world. Um, of course, the UK started out wanting to recover its imperial status. It wanted to be a big player, you know, then as now. <laughs> um, and of course, it's pursued that vigorously ever since. And of course, at the start, in the kind of late 1940s, it didn't see itself as secondary to the US. So this is quite an interesting thing, I think. And a specific example of this was the coup in 1953 in Iran, which Sami has referred to. This was the um, US and British instigated overthrow of the elected 
prime minister. Um, they were determined to strengthen the rule of the Shah. I think, but interestingly, behind this coup uh, were two factors um, which have basically been present in the region, and not only the region, in, in you know worldwide where there have been interventions, very similar motivations. Um, and that's, first of all, one was basically about oil. It was um, about the control of the oil, as so many Western interventions in the Middle East have been. And the other one was um, a geostrategic move, because at that time the West feared that Mossadegh, who was an Arab nationalist, was becoming too close to the Soviet Union. So those kind of two sorts of factors, the kind of political control and positioning and the uh, resource concerns really often um, the motivations of imperialist interventions. Um, as Sami explained, um, Mossadegh wanted to make sure that Anglo-Iranian oil wasn't just ripping off Iran basically. Um, and so um, they refused to play ball. And so he nationalized um, the Iran's oil industry and expelled foreign corporate representatives from the country. So Britain then began a kind of economic warfare against Iran, um, uh, instigating a boycott, worldwide boycott of Iranian oil to put uh, pressure on Iran economically. And of course, again, we're seeing in these kinds of situations that sanctions, economic sanctions, economic warfare being used by imperialism. And they also used um, Iranian agents to try and undermine Mossadegh's government. Um, so that didn't quite work out as they were hoping. So the subsequent coup uh, was carried out by the US and the UK to get rid of Mossadegh. But pressure from Britain on the US, as, as Sammy mentioned, that was absolutely instrumental in their participation in the coup. So the current type of situation where the US does it and the, the UK tails behind, this wasn't the case at the start. Um, so, um, but nevertheless, the prominent role of Britain as an independent actor was on its last legs, um, and the US kicked it aside pretty brutally, to be honest, because the US was pursuing its own post-war goal, which was access to markets globally. You know, that was its strong desire to get the markets going again. The Soviet Union was one block on this, you know, because the West didn't have access to um, state socialist markets. But of course, former European colonial empires were a block on it too, because they had preferential tariffs and so on. So um, the US was totally brutal about knocking out the European colonial empires. And this came to a head, as, as Sammy mentioned, in 1956, as Suez, the Suez crisis was a watershed, an absolute watershed in British politics. Um, the Suez Canal was um, a key transport and trade route for the European um, uh, in empires or whatever's post empires to their colonies and former colonies um, in Asia. Uh, President Nasser um, nationalized the canal. Britain, France, and Israel invaded to return to reverse the nationalization and restore British and French control of the canal. But the US then steps in. It has no intention of allowing these countries to restore their colonial control in the area because it wanted to dominate the region itself. Now, at this time, and the kind of post-war um, austerity in the period just after that, both the US and both Britain and France were dependent on the US economically, and the US just pulled the economic plug on them. Uh, their, their economies went into crisis, and so their colonial adventure was defeated, you know, as simple as that. But a number of lessons were learned um, which have really shaped the, these kinds of politics um, ever since. Israel learned that the US was the most powerful ally that it could have, and it promptly totally orientated to the US. Britain learned that it couldn't afford to go against the US, and we've seen how Britain has basically been 
on the coattails of the US ever since, you know, developing and trying to maintain the so-called special relationship. And of course, as a result, it's been able to mop up lucrative contracts. We saw that particularly in Iraq, you know, go there, blow things up and then get paid to rebuild them, you know, that sort of situation. And of course, it also managed to hang on somehow to a bit of big player status, you know, being in the aura of the United States. So we've seen that very clearly over Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere, and now over Gaza um, in particular, we're seeing this taking place. So I'd like to touch on the nuclear aspect of the special relationship too, uh, because it ties in with a development that's coming up politically uh, this year. Um, as you know, you've probably all seen the film Oppenheimer, US and UK worked together on the Manhattan Project. But after 1945, again, the US excluded the UK. I mean, the rationale at the time was that the UK project was pretty leaky because there were kind of, I don't know, Soviet spies or whatever. But that was the reason given. So the UK struggled to develop its own nuclear project. It had some successes, but it basically limped along and was unable to produce much. Then in 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik, and that was a real wake-up call to the US about Soviet technological advances. And so they decided to let Britain back in the nuclear tent, so to speak, to help out. And in 1958, they signed, the US and UK signed the so-called Mutual Defense Agreement, which was the most extensive nuclear sharing agreement in the world and Britain's attempts at independent nuclear weapons ended. You know, so Britain is joined to the hip um, of the US in the nuclear sense. And this also um, underpins the, the kind of other aspects of the special relationship too. So the, in fact, the mutual defense agreement is coming up for renewal in parliament this year. So <laughs> hopefully watch this space and see us raising the profile of this. We had a a uh, recent webinar with Declassified UK, who are also working on this too. So we're going to try and uh, raise this, get debate on it inside and outside Parliament. So it just uh, doesn't just uh, go ahead, uh, go through on the nod. So that was another stage um, in weakening um, UK independence and really um, increasing the kind of UK's dependent relationship that it has with the US and British support for the US war on terror, Blair's support for the war in Iraq, also very clear examples. And we'd actually seen an intensification of this in the last few years. During the Trump, Trump presidency, we saw uh, an increasing tendency for Britain to repeat US policy formulations, particularly around China, ideological rhetoric around that. Uh, then it was very clearly laid out in 2021, Boris Johnson's extensive foreign and defence policy review, which was him setting out his view of Britain's global role, which was basically like a, an attack dog for the US, <laughs> um, all that kind of thing. But situating Britain firmly as the US's junior partner, that's clear throughout. And the key strategic shift there um, lay in the focus uh, on the Indo-Pacific region, described as a tilt, so this orientation towards uh, sort of stoking up uh, militarization and military assets in that region, obviously as a counterweight to China. And um, the Middle East, which obviously was so central in the previous 15 or 20 years, was completely marginalized in, in significance, you know, in relationship to the kind of focus on China and to some extent on Russia as well. What we've seen more recently, Sunak, um, a year ago, he updated this policy, big policy framework to take into account Russia's invasion of Ukraine and he increased the anti-China focus too. And again, it had little about the Middle East, but I just want to just quickly quote some bits from what it says about the Middle East, because I think this is very informative. And it said, the UK did not foresee in the short to medium term, large scale interventions in the Middle East on the scale of those brought to an end in Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, 
that's a relief then, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, what about the middle to long term? Do they think they're going to do that? But anyway, that's that's their framework. And it says, Ten minutes, thanks. Yeah. So it says Britain wants to make deep and abiding contributions to regional security through diplomacy and security cooperation. And it highlighted in particular the importance of the UK's partnership with the Gulf states and Israel. And that's what we've seen unfolding, you know, prior to um, the attacks um, on Gaza. Um, and it says the period since 2021 has seen a rapid increase in the depth and quality of these partnerships. And we look forward to developing and strengthening them. So that was their framework prior to October. And so far, what we've seen is that the war on Gaza has reaffirmed the UK state's commitment to Israel. And of course, we know uh, full well that the genocide on Gaza is not just an Israeli genocide on Gaza, it's a Western genocide too. And I think we can say that no matter how much British policy asserts that things have gone beyond the Middle East to focus elsewhere in the world. The reality is there will be no peace in the Middle East and until Palestine is free. And what we're seeing is a, um, the onslaught on Gaza is upending politics. It's upending them here in Britain. We've seen over the last weeks and months, and it's upending them elsewhere too. And that is not going to end until Palestine is sovereign and free. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kate. And um, thanks for setting that into in such a global and historic context. I think that's um, really important and uh, really fascinating for those of us who don't follow these things so closely. Um, right, what, what I'm going to do now is I've got one question each for um, for each of our speakers to come back on and then there's a there's a lot of questions thank you for all the questions um so one each if you could keep the answers relatively brief that would be helpful and then i'm going to give you one last round of a lot of questions <laughs> and um you don't have to answer them all but maybe pick which ones you want to speak on and you think are the most important um and so apologies we won't get to everything but without further ado um bernard first to bring things right up to the present um, what are the exact ways that the UK government enables Israel's illegal occupation now um, and has and where are its partnerships and what can more importantly, what can we do about it? What are the key demands and movements that can break it? Yeah, well, in terms of the current situation, something which I think people really need to take note of is the 2030 UK Israel roadmap. And this was a document signed uh, in January of last year, which spelt out 12 areas of cooperation between Israel and Britain and talked about creating a st strategic partnership. And these zones include all sorts of areas of technology, cyber technology, information technology, but also cultural, academic, health, um, all, all different kind of areas of it. So... I think it's critically important to be aware of that. And clearly, uh, part of it is Britain looking to make um, relationships with Israel of an economic kind of linking up companies. For example, they've already got contracts with the health service in North Yorkshire and various places, uh, and similarly in, in the other fields that I've mentioned. So that's one part. One part is also the uh, arms licenses that are given by Britain to uh, companies to sell arms to Israel, parts that are used in, in planes uh, that are currently uh, engaged in the bombing activities of, uh, of Gaza. Uh, and obviously that is something to which we should be demanding ceases immediately. Uh, in addition to that, of course, there are financing arrangements from banks like Barclays, which are um, giving enormous facility to uh, companies to operate in that area. And what we have been campaigning for as a Palestine solidarity campaign is, is in conjunction with the Boycott National Committee based in Palestine, is the policy of boycott, disinvestment and sanctions, and really wanting to encourage that people take that up. We're focusing on a couple of companies at the moment, like Barclays in particular, who are complicit in um, the funding of um, 
Israeli initiatives, Israeli companies that are directly involved in the occupation. So that roadmap is is a it absolutely spells out in all sorts of ways um, the context of that. And I think I strongly suspect that um, whatever government is elected, it's highly likely that they will seek to maintain it. So I think one of the campaigns we have to wage is in, is to break that relationship, to end that agreement uh, and to cease any cooperation with Israel. Uh, I mean, we should be doing things like sending the ambassador back and uh, withdrawing the British ambassador and in, imposing the kind of sanctions that are currently imposed on, on Russia in terms of uh, com a country that is occupying uh, land which they should not be in. And obviously supporting the International Court of Justice and the decisions that it takes and ensuring that consequences flow from that that actually have a direct effect on uh, what Israel is doing. Thanks, Bernard. And um, of course, there's things we can all do, aren't there, to uh, support the boycott, divestment and, and sanctions demands um, individually and both in terms of, of calls on our own institutions, um, wherever we work or do business or, or so on. Um, for Sammy, could you give more background on the war on Yemen and the role of the UK, including, again, through weapon sales and other military support? And also, um, perhaps um, for people who haven't been following it, uh, outlining the humanitarian toll of the, the Saudi war crimes in Yemen. So another small question to, to do. <laughs> OK, thanks, Rachel. Yeah, um, I didn't have time. Actually, Yemen was on my uh, on my list of things to talk about. Um, uh, Britain uh, colonized Yemen. And there was uh, there were a number of uh, uh, wars of uh, resistance for independence, and independence wasn't achieved until the 60s. Uh, Britain also tried to divide the Yemeni people, south and north. So there were two Yemens at one stage, North Yemen and South Yemen. Uh, but the Yemeni people have an incredible history of fighting for their dignity and independence. And what we see today in terms of their support for the uh, people in Gaza to stop the genocide in Gaza and how heroically they are conducting themselves in, in support of the Palestinian people is nothing strange really to the Yemeni people. Uh, many people in the region were, are not surprised that the people of Yemen are doing this. They are putting their necks out to support the, the uh, Palestinian people. Uh, the Yemeni people suffered enormously through an eight and a half year uh, war led uh, ostensibly by Saudi Arabia, but really it was run through an operations room in Saudi, uh, manned by uh, a US, British and other officers Western officers and obviously Saudi and others, but uh, this uh, this war uh, led to the killing of nearly three hundred thousand Yemeni people. Yemen was uh, besieged; uh, uh, no food was let in, no medicine, and uh, the humanitarian crisis in Yemen was described by the United Nations as the worst in the history. Of the of the region and the world in some respects, um, only the the genocide in Gaza today, if you like, in terms of the threat to to health and uh, and food and water and so on, is 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 worse than what happened in Yemen. But uh, but the Yemeni people have struggled enormously. It's uh, the the conflicts within Yemen in terms of uh, the politics inside Yemen is rather complex, but what we need to understand is the Western way of describing the government in Sana'a, Sana'a is the capital of Yemen, as Houthis, is really to belittle the Yemeni people's achievement. Uh, the, um, the leader of the uh, Yemeni people today is somebody called uh, Abdul Malik al-Houthi, his, uh, his surname is Al Houthi, belonging to some ancient tribes in uh, uh, in Yemen. But really, it's a broad coalition 
of forces, of democratic forces. Uh, some are socialists, some are religious, and so on. Um, and his uh, the movement led by uh, Abdel Malik Al Houthi is called Ansarullah. So Ansarullah is the dominant force within this broad coalition. There were some forces in South Yemen uh, fighting against uh, the government in Sana'a. But after the war on Gaza and the stands taken by the government in Sana'a, a lot of these forces that were fighting them have stopped fighting them and welcomed their support for the Palestinian people. Uh, just one final point to stress here is that uh, uh, the, the uh, targeting of uh, ships is exclusively uh, of Israeli ships and ships destined to go to Israel. Ships that might carry a convenience flag, but they are destined to Israel or coming from Israel, the port of Elat. Uh, but uh, the United States and Britain are pretending that they are co protecting international navigation through the Red Sea. That is not true. Not a single ship was targeted beyond those going to Israel or coming from Israel. Uh, but today, because Britain and the United States started bombing Yemen, the, then British and American uh, ships are included in the list to be targeted by Yemen. So this has to be made clear. So really, ultimately, it's the United States and Britain that have turned this uh, targeting of Israeli uh, uh, destined uh, uh, ships into a full scale uh, prevention of uh, most of the ships going to, to into the Red Sea to the Suez Canal, for example. Um, I'll stop there. It's quite a long history, but uh, maybe I, I, I shed some light there. Certainly you did, and um, thank you for doing that and for being so, <laughs> condensing such a lot um, into into what you're saying. Um, Kate, for you, um, just two sort of greater depth um, questions really around nuclear weapons. So firstly on developments around Lake and Heath and the return of US nuclear weapons to Britain, um, if you could say something about why that's significant and what what we can do about it um, right on our doorsteps. Um, and then secondly, more details around Israel's nuclear arsenal. Okay, well, um, Lake and Heath. So Lake and Heath is um, nominally an RAF base in Suffolk. It's kind of between Norwich and Cambridge, but it's actually in Suffolk. I say nominally because although it's called that, um, it's actually wholly run and staffed and everything by the US Air Force. For some years, up until 2008, um, American free fall nuclear bombs were stationed there. And um, they were the same type of bombs as the US NATO bombs stationed in a number of countries in Western Europe. So they were part of the so-called um, kind of NATO nuclear umbrella. In 2008, they were removed. Um, we gather from documents and so on that it was because of um, persistent protests there. We had uh, pretty much, well, very, very regular protests and so on. It was also on the kind of back of the uh, massive anti-war protests earlier, you know, few years earlier, so they decided to get rid of them. Uh, good. Um, the yeah. bad news is that we found out um, last year, or was it just the year before, um, that the Americans are um, in the process of returning those nuclear weapons. By in the process, I mean that um, the um, nuclear facilities that were still there, they're being upgraded, and there's all new blocks of building work and so on um, being there done there to house them and to house the nuclear uh, personnel that will be dealing with those things. The new F-35 bombers that will carry them are already there and are already uh, in other the other locations in Western Europe. The significant thing about these bombs in particular is that the old ones, they were just called therefore free fall gravity bombs, i.e. you fly over somewhere and you just drop it off. So they're kind of 
relatively limited in what they can do. The new, these new upgraded ones, they're they're called. They have a kind of guided bomb function, which means that they can be targeted um, and used in that way. Which means, technically speaking, they can be used as first strike weapons. Um, so those bringing those to Britain is a real escalation of uh, nuclear tension in Europe. So it's it's causing a big problem. Um, when Russia discovered about it, they said that you know this they saw this as a provocation, and they have used that as their justification for bringing their some of their nuclear weapons into Belarus. So it's a kind of uh, very bad process going on. And of course, what it means is that. Britain uh, will once again be on the front line in a US NATO nuclear war. Yes, we've got nuclear submarines and all that kind of stuff. Supposedly, they don't seem to be able to fire anything properly, apparently. Um, but um, that they will really put Britain on the front line. So that that's a very dangerous thing. We've um, we are raising awareness. There's been quite a lot of media coverage of this. Good. Um, we've actually uh, taken a legal challenge um, to the MOD and the local council because they haven't done all the properties on the basis of, um, you know, planning law and stuff. They haven't planned, got permission to <laughs> basically put nuclear weapons there under local health and safety stuff. So we've got all that going on. On May the 11th, we have a, a national day of action. So there will be stuff going on at Lake and Heath. There's also going to be stuff in London and, and across the country. So please do look at CND's website, get involved in that. Um, we don't want these nuclear weapons back here. We Not only did we get rid of them in 2008, we also, um, at the end of the 80s, got rid of a whole class of nuclear weapons, you know, cruise missiles, Pershing missiles, they were all got rid of. So we can do it, we've done it before, so we can do it again. So. Um, let's get active on it. And then um, Israel's nuclear weapons. Yes, um, Sammy, I think it was mentioned that uh, Israel has a serious nuclear arsenal. This is in some ways unlike other nuclear arsenals, because whereas others have been admitted to um, and therefore are under international scrutiny and so on, checks and all that procedures, Israel has never formally admitted to them, so they're completely unscrutinized and all that kind of thing by relevant international institutions. Um, Britain and other countries played a role in Israel getting them completely illegally against all international law. So that's one side of it. So, uh, someone I noticed mentioned in the Q&A box, Mordecai Venunu, he was the great Israeli uh, nuclear whistleblower. You know, he worked in the nuclear facility in Dimona and he revealed what was going on. So that's why we know, basically. They have um, quite advanced forces. They have, unlike, unlike Britain, which actually only has submarine based nuclear weapons, they have submarine, they have land based, and they have airdropped nuclear weapons. So significant force. Um, for me, the, what's particularly interesting is the submarine force. This is the Dolphin class um, submarines, uh, some of which were given them to them outright by Germany and some of which they're buying from Germany. And apparently in, in expert reports, it says that Germany knew they would be used for nuclear weapons. So completely illegal under international law to do something like that, to facilitate a country nuclear pr proliferating. So uh, a very dangerous situation. As we know, Israel is the only nuclear weapon state in the region. In spite of all the spin and fluff about it, Iran does not have nuclear weapons. Israel is the country that has nuclear weapons in the Middle East. So it's it's very, very dangerous. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm really sorry, this is going to be our last round of questions. There's so many and so many topics we could cover and so much detail we could go into but um with, uh, and with apologies to our speakers um, th these are quite wide ranging as well so please only pick up what you think you can um you know some key points you want to make because if i can ask you to um respond to these and sort of do your closing make any sort of additional closing remarks at the same time in sort of three to four minutes each once i've uh, told you what the questions are and 
just to mix it up a bit, I'm going to ask Kate to go first and then Sammy and then Bernard, so reverse order. Um, so the first question is a is a really interesting one. Um, the oppression of Palestinians has been going on for over half a century. Why is this ethnic cleansing happening now? And how does it link to the wider global picture? Um, this one perhaps for, for Bernard. Um, how can a two-state solution now be achieved? Or I might alter it and say, can a two-state solution now be achieved? Um, one from Annie. Who, on whose side is the ICJ really? And finally from Carol, do we know what motivated the US to intervene in 1956? And are there possible dynamics at play currently that could push the US to rein in the Israeli regime? And I think probably best if we sort of concentrate on the on the now of that. Um, uh, if that's all right. Um, so before our speakers come back and, and sort of try and address some of those questions in the, the remaining time available, um, can I just thank um, thank all our speakers and thank everyone for, for coming this evening and, and taking part in the discussion. There's um, some really good stuff in the, in the Q&A. Please do make a donation if you can so that we can keep putting on this type of event. Um, and hope to see some of you at the Arise pre-budget event coming up and also the Women for Palestine online rally on the 5th of March, which lots of um, information in the chat, which you'll have seen or on the Arise website, obviously, and obviously, you know, support for all the local and national actions for a ceasefire goes on. We, we can't um, let up on that while Palestinians are being, still being slaughtered on a daily basis. And while I've been talking, I'm sure our speakers have been answering all those questions in as few words as possible. So I'm going to um, pass to Kate first. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to briefly comment on two of those things. So whose side is the ICJ on? Um, I'm not sure I really want to comment on that. But what I would say is that what South Africa has done in taking this the, the charges to the ICJ is phenomenally important. You know, absolute respect for South Africa for doing that. Um, and I think that the the outcomes of the ICJ deliberations are absolutely uh, helpful and, and really important. They can't um, enforce it, but what they've done has a, a given an additional, not that the Palestinians need any additional moral high ground, but it kind of does give an additional moral high ground and that real uh, legal legal power. You know, and I know some people think, oh, don't bother with courts, but I think that it's an it's an extra tool. You know, anything that puts the weight on our side of the scales, you know, on the people's side of the scales, I think is really important. So let's really maximise what we can do with that. And then um, what motivated the US to intervene in 1956? Well, I, I, I mean, my, my point there was that um, what motivated them was their, their own self-interest. And it was their economic self-interest. They wanted to kick the colonialists out of the Middle East so they could play that role themselves. And of course, um, that, that has continued to today. You know, the US continues to brutally pursue its own interests in the region and its own interests everywhere. So motivated by self-interest, economic, political, everything self-interest. And that is what has to be stopped. Um, and please join CND. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. Um, I would echo that call. And of course, the you know the the ICJ outcomes are very good um, to bring into our political party branches, trade union branches, to back up the case when those are those discussions can get difficult. Um, Sammy, over to you. Uh, sorry, Rachel. Could you remind me uh, what other questions remaining? I didn't write all of them. Uh, so there's, there's <laughs> I wrote the that... ones. That, I wrote the ones that. Uh, Kate just answered, okay. <laughs> so this one about why is this happening now in terms of the long history of Palestine and the, the overall global picture and maybe in terms of what you were previously talking about, the what's going on elsewhere in the Middle East. I wonder if that's something you could address. Okay, great. Actually, this ties up with the, some of my closing remarks because I wanted to 
focus on on the resistance forces in the region. We talked, uh, obviously, all of us about what imperialism has done to the region and are doing, but uh, we haven't had time to talk about the resistance. Um, On the question of why now, uh, the question of ethnically cleansing Palestine and so on, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that the Palestinian resistance in Gaza um, was so strong, it became so strong that they managed to break out of the big concentration camp they were under for the past 16, 17 years. And they inflicted a uh, a big surprise uh, attack on, on Israel. And this kind of, uh, uh, if you like, alerted uh, U.S. imperialism, Western powers, and the Israeli ruling circus, uh, circles that they 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 would take the that uh, event to redress the balance because Israel will always portray itself as that undefeatable uh, omnipotent power that nobody can challenge it's that has power of deterrence uh, over and beyond what it actually has sometimes so they attacked uh, Gaza and uh, once they attacked Gaza they were back to their old uh, Zionist uh, dream of uh, ethnically cleansing the whole of Palestine. And if Gaza goes, then the West Bank will follow. Um, so really, we're talking about quite a historic, uh, uh, historically important event. Um, what the Palestinian people achieved in terms of breaking out of their jail. And, the, and also one has to emphasize that it's not only Hamas which is involved, it's the entire spectrum of Palestinian organizations and people from uh, the the left and socialist forces to secular democratic to religious forces. Uh, uh, Hamas happens to be the strongest militarily in Gaza. Um, So, and also it follows a long history of Palestinian resistance dating dating back to a modern Palestinian resistance dating back to 1965 when Fatah uh, launched the first military attack on Israeli forces. Um, But uh, also historically important today is that the United States is pushing Israel to crush uh, the Palestinian resistance and eventually to crush the rest of the resistance forces, namely in Lebanon, Yemen, and Iraq. And this is uh, for the first time in the history of the of the conflict the palestinian resistance have acquired a strategic depth and that strategic uh, depth is uh, by Leb- lebanese yemeni and iraqi resistance forces uh, this strategic depth was lacking because of the betrayal of the arab regimes the arab regimes allied to imperialism uh, have uh, uh, quashed any possibility of the rise of a very powerful Palestinian resistance. But today, I think uh, the resistance forces are very, very powerful. And there is a huge uh, possibility, big possibility, that this could escalate if Israel continues its genocidal war to evict the Palestinians from Rafah into the Sinai or to commit uh, 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 even greater uh, genocide, because I think uh, uh, Lebanon will enter the war, Hezbollah has declared that, and so will Yemen, and so will the Iraqi resistance. And who knows, maybe Iran could be uh, also dragged in. Iran has supplied uh, the Palestinian resistance and all these resistance forces with weapons and financial support. Um, so, uh, most of these weapons went through Syria first. But this is a, a picture which terrifies the United States. And we are talking about uh, a very powerful resistance movement. That And one of the reasons that the United States is fearing that Israel, by committing massive new uh, escalation of the genocidal war into Rafah and the killing, potential killing, of uh, over one and a half million people in Rafa will trigger that wider war. And the United States is worried about that. And they are trying to 
to see how they could manage it without having an immediate ceasefire. An immediate ceasefire will be declared in the, in the entire region as a victory for the Palestinian resistance. But the United States is, if you like, trapped. On the one hand, they want to defeat the Palestinian resistance movement. On the other hand, they do not want this war to escalate because escalation might also mean a complete defeat for Israel, uh, really an existential uh, threat to the Israeli state. Thank you. Um, and of course, the resistance is hugely inspiring, but that is a, uh, quite a, um, an, an interesting picture that, that we see over there. Um, and th thank you for sharing that. And finally, we go to um, Bernard. Sorry, muted. <laughs> um, yeah, several things. I, I certainly think myself that what we're witnessing is a crisis of the American perspective for the whole region. Uh, the Americans had built up a strategy based around the notion that they could um, weld countries in the region to a relationship with Israel through the Abraham Accords and through this process, as it were, achieve a way of hegemonizing the developments that are taking place. And that has been their strategy. And I think their concern is that what they can see, because they're not entirely stupid, is that amongst the Arab masses, that there is a revulsion at what Israel is doing to the extent that it may well threaten some of those regimes across the area. Um, you can see it in a very popular way in the way in which during the World Cup, you saw the crowds uh, expressing their support and solidarity with Palestine. And you can see that in various other manifestations, like the massive demonstrations in Yemen and demonstrations in other parts of the Arab world. So I think the Americans are facing a dilemma because um, I think what they had hoped for, what they anticipated, is in some jeopardy. And that's why they're trying to get the Israelis to rein in. Israel, of course, has its own kind of issues in the, in the equation. Uh, Netanyahu, in particular, wants to stay out of jail. Um, so he doesn't want to see things come to an end because as long as he is there, then he's safe um, from being in prison for the fraud that he's committed and other crimes that he's due to be prosecuted for. He has said, however, and I think this is something we really have to take to heart and um, informs the way we think about it. He has talked about the situation in Gaza, the war on Gaza, as the second war of independence. In Israeli terminology, the first war of independence was 1948, the Nakba, as the Palestinians call it, call it. And what he is saying is that this is the second independence war, and therefore it is for the Palestinians potentially a further Nakba. So we are seeing the crisis being developed. Clearly, the Egyptians, although they're being bribed by the Americans, don't want to receive into the um, into Egypt, uh, people who they feel politically might be um, aligned with, um, you know, forces inside Egypt who are critical of the uh, of the military there, and therefore we might see the emergence of another Arab Spring. And I think that's one of the anxieties that they have because 2012, 2011, 2012, when you saw the Arab Springs, you saw the potential for uh, uprising across the region against the sort of perspectives that were being expressed by those countries and the kind of regimes that operated. So I think it is a really critical moment for the whole region, not just for Palestine. But I am fearful about the situation in Palestine, and I don't think we can in any way uh, minimise the significance of what is happening, because it is a massive, massive onslaught against the Palestinians. And despite the resistance that clearly continues to be there, um, the carnage and the genocide that is being conducted, uh, destroying the infrastructure of the region of Gaza, um, leading to kind of you know wholesale um, decimation of the population. All of these things are a generational will have a generational impact unless a perspective develops which can unify the whole of the Palestinian people in developing an alternative to what is happening. And I think that has still to emerge, the actions by the Israelis in the West Bank 
killing more than 400, nearly 500 people in the West Bank, um, detaining four, four, four and a half thousand people in the West Bank. All of them show that the Israelis, I think, are operating uh, this strategy uh, as a whole uh, offensive against the Palestinians, not just an offensive in relation to Gaza, although Gaza is this absolutely worst a catastrophic manifestation of that. Now, when people talk about what will happen for the future or what might happen or what might be possible or what ought to happen, um, clearly from the point of view of we in the Solidarity Movement call for the rights of the Palestinian people for self-determination and therefore whatever way in which uh, they feel they can achieve that or the way in which that should be uh, organised and structured is, is a matter for them to determine. But what is blatantly obvious is that it is the Israelis who are destroying the notion of a two-state solution. Uh, their occupation and expansion in the settlement areas, um, the uh, grow, you know, the ex expansion that is taking place uh, daily with the authorization of new settlements being built um, and the developments that are taking place there um, mean that the notion of the 67 borders, for, for example, which is the notional idea that the two states would be based on don't exist anymore. They've been eradicated. And Netanyahu has said quite bluntly he won't accept a Palestinian state. So, you know, I think there is a long way to go in terms of kind of how an alternative political perspective will develop. But clearly, the two states is not uh, at all viable because it's been destroyed by the Israelis themselves. Um, what I think in, in respect of... Um, the ICJ ruling, ruling. I mean, clearly one of the challenges with that is that it has no powers of implementation. It's, a, if you like, it's a, a political moral statement. But then when it comes to implementation, obviously uh, how that happens, there is no military force, if you like, that can be called into action in order to implement um, steps that would prevent the continuation of the genocide and stop what is happening. But it does have a moral and political standing, which I think is important in terms of kind of building the campaign and giving confidence to the Palestinians that they're not alone. And we have to keep saying that to people. We who support the Palestinians, we are the majority in the world and we shouldn't uh, in any way be intimidated or uh, be cowed by any notions that we're supporting something that's exceptional or that should not be, uh, should not be backed. So, there are massive challenges ahead, undoubtedly. And as has been said, I think it's important that the actions of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign stop the war and CND, Friends of Al-Aqsa and other organisations and comrades have been mobilising, that people respond to that, that we build that outwards, that we engage with the trade union movement, with community organisations, and we build more massive demonstrations in order to make it very clear what happened in Parliament was an absolute farce. But in my view, it was a reflection of the crisis <coughs> resulting from the tragedy that's happening in Gaza and the way in which that is impinging, impinging on general popular consciousness. But it's also a reflection of the campaign and the impact that has had. When MPs are saying they've had more emails on this topic than anything else uh, in their parliamentary career, I think that shows that the campaign is having real weight and real substance. And obviously, there may, there may, as people have indicated, there may be other dimensions of the campaign that need to be addressed if uh, the war escalates to Lebanon or to Yemen or, or to other places. But for this point in time, I think what's absolutely vital is that we build a solidarity movement that has real impact on the politics here and hopefully gives support and sustenance to comrades in Palestine fighting for the right to self-determination. Thanks, Bernard. Such an important point to finish on. And thanks, everyone. Sorry, we've run on a bit. There's quite a lot to, <laughs> there's been such a lot to cover, but really important. And see you on the next demo. Solidarity. Thank you.